When you hear the name NASA, I bet like me, you focus on the letter S, don't you? Space. Mercury, Gemini, Apollo programs, even the space shuttle and the International Space Station. But that first letter A stands for aeronautics. And this week, we delve into NASA flight test with a research pilot who has been flying their F-18s and F-15s for dozens of years. And a former test pilot returns to help us make sense of it. It's all this week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Hit it. Localizer needle starting to work its way back in. Man on the speed break. Still a little bit of side to side motion on the stick. Now it's a good one. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome to episode 115. Today is NASA Flight Test with Mills Larson. We'll get to him in just a little bit. But before we do, we have some help. As always, you know I hate to podcast alone. So returning is former episode 22 guest, Becky Shaw. How's it going, Recky? It's going well out here in Lakeland, Florida, near the Aircraft Operations Center for the Hurricane Hunters. That's right. At NOAA. Yeah, that's the last time we heard from you was episode 91. You were just dipping your toe in that. So what's new? Well, I'm now on the Hurricane Watch Bill. We're in the very beginning of the 2021 season, and there are no storms at the moment, so I have time to be on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. <laughs> well, it's always a joy to have you back. You know, I reached out to you, what, about a week ago? I was like, hey, I got this NASA flight test thing coming up. Do you want to listen? And you were like, oh, yeah, this sounds really good with your experiences, because on episode 22, we talked test pilot school stuff, so I think this will be fun. Before we get to it, though, just a couple quick announcements. Now, Recky, I don't know if you've been affected or not, but our show, for whatever reason, has had trouble coming out on Apple Podcasts. And I think, if I heard correctly, Apple had some sort of update. So the most recent episode for me came out on my iPad, but not my iPhone. For those of you who are writing in, please know that we're doing our best to complain to Apple. But if you listen on your iPhone, then you might not get the episodes the day they release. Uh, let's see what else. We had a really cool episode about the Battle of Midway, episode 114. We did that one with some YouTube visuals this time. If you enjoyed that, you won't be too upset if we don't do it all the time. It is a lot more work, but yeah, we had fun with that. So we'll try to do more. And then just recently, we had a bonus episode with Roland White talking about Harrier 807 and the Harrier's role in uh, the Falkland Islands. So that's all good stuff, but you know, Recky, uh, I don't think we're going to do any listener questions here today, just in the interest of getting through what we're going to talk about, but you had a chance to listen to the NASA flight test interview. What did you think? Well, like your listeners, I love every episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. <laughs> this one is awesome. I think, as you'll see as we listen through the episode, NASA and NOAA also like has like our science and engineering part of our country have a lot of like the early parts of developing technology for aviation. And so having Nils kind of talk through what sort of giving like a picture of what this looks like provides a lot of insight on some of the most cutting edge technology and like that it actually starts before we get it in the military. So I think this is a great episode and I was really excited yeah. after I listened to it to be able to co-host with you today. Well, good. And that's why I want to skip questions and kind of just get straight to it because it was a very enlightening and fun interview and we've got you to offer some thoughts when we come back. So tell you what, let's get to thrills nils and we'll uh, meet on the backside of the interview. What do you say, Reggie? Sounds great. All right. Today I am thrilled to be joined by Lieutenant Colonel Nils Larson. He's retired from the United States Air Force. He works out at Edwards Air Force Base and he works for NASA Armstrong. How's it going, Thrills? Uh, it's great. Thanks for having me. Well, you're welcome, and thanks for taking the time. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion today because, as is so often the case, there's a lot of things that I know a little bit about, but the beauty of having a podcast is I can ask it in greater depth, and you're going to help us understand NASA Armstrong and all the different flight test things you guys are doing. But, but first, let's get to know Thrills. Where are you from? Where did you go to school, and what did you do in the military, and what are you doing now? 
Uh, well, I was uh, grew up in West Virginia and West Africa oh, wow. and decided I wanted to be a test pilot. So I uh, went to the Air Force Academy, then I got a degree in astronautical engineering, went to pilot training, flew T-37s, then went to U-2s, went to test pilot school. After that, they didn't know what to do with me, so they let me fly F-15s and flight tests and some other stuff. Didn't exchange with the Navy and <laughs> uh, eventually uh, finished out my 20-year uh, Air Force career and walked down the street to NASA and been doing really cool stuff ever since. Oh, cool. Yeah, good. Well, I really want to peel the onion back on that a little bit because I remember going to an air show as a young kid. I Gosh, it might have been in the 80s. We were driving out. You know, for us, it was like a forbidden fruit to go out to the lake there. So at the time, I think it was Dryden, and we'll get into names in a little bit, but I know they do a lot of cool stuff out there. So, all right, let's start with, you know, I don't know about the rest of the world, but when I hear the word NASA, I tend to focus on the S as in Gemini, Mercury, Apollo programs, even the space shuttle and the ISS. And by the way, I have a UCLA alum friend up there right now. But as the name implies, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration is so much more. And I'm sure you can attest to that with your experiences. Well, yeah, we're the first A in NASA, and we've been around longer than NASA. I mean, uh, Dryden, now Armstrong, way before that was the High Speed Flight Research Station, and uh, it was back under the NACA. And oh, by the way, you don't say NACA to somebody who used to work at the NACA because they Ooh. take offense to that. So, important safety tip. <laughs> but, you know, where I work has been around, you know, longer than NASA. So, it's uh, really interesting. And Aeronautics probably has a lot more direct influence on people's lives than they realize in all the different stuff that's been done over the years through the NACA and NASA Aeronautics. Well, and that's what I hope to explore today. So let's start with the names. Why not? Because again, when I went to that air show way back when, it was, I believe, NASA Dryden. I've heard of NASA Ames, and I know there's others. Is it all now just under NASA Armstrong, or what are these names and what do they mean? Well, Ames is up in Northern California, and then you got JPL down there in uh, Pasadena. So California actually has three different NASA centers. Mm -hmm. Armstrong used to be Dryden, and Hugh Dryden was the first deputy administrator, if I remember right, of NASA. The center was originally named for him. And then more recently, within the last, oh, I don't remember whether it was probably six years ago-ish, maybe, we were renamed after Neil Armstrong because Neil Armstrong used to work there before he got picked to go down and be an astronaut. <laughs> you know, he used to sit like a couple of desks over from where I sit now. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> well, anyone who's seen the movie First Man remembers the scenes of him doing that and his journey, at least Hollywood's interpretation of it. All right. So what is the mission of NASA Armstrong today? And maybe if you're willing, you can take us through a little history from when it used to be called Dryden and what they do out there in Edwards. Well, one of the things we like to say is we're trying to take what's only imagined, take it to flight. So that's one of the big things, you know, we're about flying when it comes to NASA Armstrong. So that's our main focus when it comes to it. Many of the other NASA centers that do aeronautics work, they have a lot of great wind tunnels, a lot of great computing power, a lot of that kind of stuff. Our forte is flight. A lot of the X-planes, like when you go back to the X-1, Chuck Yeager, you know, and all that, NACA was part of that program. We were there back in the original X-Plane series, you know, they were NACA and the Air Force or the Army Air Corps, depending on, you know, how far back you go. But, you know, as time went on, names change as they do. And eventually, as I said before, became NASA Armstrong. A lot of interesting work has been done there. If you ever go look in the parking lot out there, digital flight controls started there. So all the stuff that you think about, like in an F-16 and all the modern digital flight controls you have on airliners and everything else that's out there, started there. And it was interesting because when they went to go do it originally, from what I understand, Neil Armstrong at the time had already been to the moon and had come back and was the director of aeronautics for NASA. And as they were looking at fly-by-wire aircraft, one of the things he suggested was, hey, why don't you think about digital? You know, we got a great processor that was there in the LEM, and they went, hmm, let's go check it out. So then digital fly-by-wire is one of the many things that started there. If you look in the parking lot, you'll see an SR-71. So there's 
you know, a lot of high speed research. It used to be the high speed research center. So every time everybody is going faster and higher and all that stuff, that was us. <laughs> so X15, X1, X2, you know, through all those X's, most of that was us. There are some X planes that were up at Ames that have tend to do with more like helicopter like things or vertical flight, that kind of thing. Most of the X planes, we were working with the Air Force or DOD when it came to a lot of those X planes, because that is part of our charter, you know, when it came way back from NACA through NASA, is to assist whenever they need that kind of assistance, whether it comes from the technologies, the people, that kind of thing that we have, because we're a lot more research focused as opposed to the development focus that you're going to see with DOD. So if we can go back to some of the organizations just for a moment, I guess, are you like siblings in a sense in the same family? Are there commonalities or shared burdens or efforts with some of the other, like you said, down at JPL in Pasadena or Ames or even the folks down at Kennedy? Are you challenging each other for budgets? I mean, what's that relationship like? Siblings is probably a great way to think of it, you know, because, okay. you know, you are somewhat challenged back and forth when it comes to money. There's only so much that goes around when it comes to what you're doing, but at the same time, you're working with each other. So, Mm. you know, we don't necessarily have all the expertise in certain items when it comes down to it. So you will find that there's a lot of cooperation and collaboration that goes across the centers all the way back to Langley, NASA Langley, which is on or next to Langley Air Force Base. Gotcha. Then, you know, we have aims that we discussed before. There are things that we have done or will do when it comes to working with JSC or working with NASA Glenn, which is up in Cleveland. It really is. I mean, I've been really impressed. I've been on several projects lately that I am spanning across NASA and I'm always impressed with the people that I work with at Armstrong. And then when I look at the people that are at all these other places, they're cut from the same piece of cloth. They're just amazingly (laughs) talented people. And it's so much fun working with them. A project that just the other day, I just remember thinking, I really love working with this person. He is just so down to earth, so smart, and he agrees with me. So. Yeah. Well, you're lucky to have that experience after you retire from the military because a lot of us move on and we miss that camaraderie. So good on you. Uh, Of course, you arguably pay a little price for where you're located, but I suppose a lot like for the Navy when we were based in Fallon, a lot of people loved it and stayed there anyway. But I suppose Edwards and wherever you live has its own charm. And I can let you comment on that if you like, or I can keep going. Yeah, it's tough. I was the chief pilot for almost a decade there at Armstrong. It was interesting whenever we had the job ads out there because there were a lot of great people. There were a lot of friends that applied for the job. And we used to tell them when they came out for the interview, you might want to bring your wife because, (laughs) you know, it's an acquired taste. You know, it was one thing because I was here in the desert. I was already established. You know, at one point I had applied to come out for a job there and my wife, I was on the East Coast at the time, she just kind of looked at me like, why would we go back there? Because we met out here originally. (laughs) It was different when the Air Force sent me out here and then it was time for me to leave. We were already established. It's a lot easier, you know, than trying to get somebody to move there. We have had people that, you know, we said, we want to hire you. And they said, yeah, I really want the job, but I really love my family and I can't do that. So, and and that's valid. Yeah. Well, and I've heard some people will commute from, I think as far away as what, Tehachapi. So they get a little mountain experience, but people from Santa Clarita, you know, uh, and that's a pretty good drive, you know, so it's hour and 15, hour and a half. So yeah. A trade-off in life, but Nils, so getting back to siblings, I want to ask about industry because the things you're doing and you just alluded to the digital fly by wire flight controls went on to benefit the then general dynamics f-16 but nasa is a government organization right funded by taxpayers so how does that work as far as the testing you're doing the information you're gathering whether it's wind tunnels or in flight test or whatever how does that find its way then into industry well it's a great question and one of the big things for nasa is the information that we get normally is supposed to be 
out there for everybody, depending on how we do it. Now, we do collaborate a lot of times with other industry partners, and then that becomes a little more difficult because sometimes the idea or the design or whatever is theirs. So, there is a certain amount of stuff that can and can't be released. So, it really depends, and that has to be negotiated ahead of time. we got lawyers for everything. Of course. And their job is to figure out what is the data that we're allowed to release to everybody that becomes, you know, essentially public property. And what is it that belongs to the contractor that they get to hold on to for either X amount of years or whenever it is. So most of that has to be negotiated ahead of time and it can be somewhat difficult. The big thing is we try to take early ideas and advance them along. Mm. The other thing that you'll see when it comes to like some of the X planes or some of the big things that are going on in NASA now is they're designed to be an advantage for everybody, not necessarily just one group. So when you look at something like, let's take, I'm on the X-59, the low boom flight demonstration. So the X-59 Quest, that aircraft is an X-plane and it is designed to go out and do a demonstration to get data so that we can reset, you know, essentially right now you can't go supersonic over land just because of the boom it makes. Basically, it's just thou shalt not go faster than the speed of sound unless you're the government or we give you special permission. So, and that's hard to get. So everybody said, well, wait a minute. If what you don't like is the boom, why don't we just put a limit on what the sound's allowed to be? So everybody went, hey, that's a great idea. How are we going to go do that? So if you're an aircraft manufacturer, you're going to break the bank just to go design something to go get the data to turn to the FAA and go, this is what we think the sound level should be. This is the perfect job for NASA, is to go out and build this demonstrator so that we can go collect the data and then basically turn to industry and go, if you can make a plane that is quieter than this, then that should be fine and the public should be good with it. And, you know, go forth and build supersonic airplanes to drag us around the country twice as fast as we go now. (laughs) <laughs> and so the data that you come up with with your team becomes kind of what public domain is probably the wrong description, but it's available for industry. Is it close? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty close. I mean, if it's the design of the airplane itself, pieces of that belong to Lockheed mm-hmm. when it comes to that. But the actual data from the aircraft, the boom level. So essentially, when we go out there, Phase one, we're going to go out there and we do the airworthiness, make sure the airplane's safe. Phase two is actually making sure the prediction that we had, does the modeling match what really is there, both next to the airplane and all the way to the ground. And then the third phase is, I always call it coming to a town near you, is it's a road show. We take the X plane out on the road and we go to various communities, you know, around the United States, depending on different terrain features and temperatures and all the other kind of stuff that they look at, essentially the scientific experiment that they set up. We go collect the data, but the people that, you know, are providing the data is actually the public. So the public is going to be commenting on the, what we call the thump that they'll hear, because it's not really a sonic boom anymore out of a low boom airplane. It's more of a thump. Hmm. Sounds kind of like maybe distant rolling thunder or somebody slamming a car door. That's kind of the idea that what you would hear from this thing. And then essentially, hopefully you can get the data from the people to go, I didn't even hear it. Or yeah, that wasn't too bad. (laughs) The dog didn't even bark, you know, or whatever. So but the point is, though, you have to give the public an opportunity to exactly respond, even if you don't expect most of them to. And some will, right, who have agendas and others won't, Who, because like this, you said, it's either sounds like thunder or the car or whatever. But so that's interesting. How about the uh, people that are there? I assume, I don't know even how many there are. Are there active duty and retired like you? Are they all test pilot school graduates, I presume? No, not necessarily. We have a pretty good mix of people. And I mean, the aircraft that we have there at Armstrong, we have everything from RC models that we have people that that's their forte. They are RC modelers and pilots that fly those things all the way up to people who fly 747s. So maybe a third of our pilots-ish might be actual school trained test pilots. We do a lot of airborne science work. We have a big telescope that sits in the back of a 747 that flies all night and they go out and do a lot of cool stuff with that thing. Then we also do a lot of uh, airborne science work where we're studying planet Earth. We fly a lot of different sensors, drive all over the place, over the Arctic, over the Antarctic, you name it. 
just all over the planet collecting data for everyone. So you don't necessarily have to be a test pilot to go do that stuff. So we have a pretty good mix. Some pretty decent chunk of us are former military at some point, not necessarily all retired. We do have some people that are not, you know, former military, but we fly some of the oldest stuff. One of our jokes, you know, essentially is using yesterday's airplanes to develop tomorrow's (laughs) technology. Let's see, I got uh, coming up, I got to go do some sim work for a DC-8. There's only a couple DC-8s still flying in the entire world. One of them's ours. Wow. It's a fun, it's a great airplane. Love it. I get to fly the fast movers and then I get to go fly a DC-8. So pretty cool job. And how does that work? Because when I was in the Navy, if I was in a regular fleet squadron, and I had a NATOPS qual, we would call it, I think your equivalent is what, a Dash 1 or something? Right. But if I flew in a squadron that had F-18s, I was qualified in the F-18. Then when I went to Fallon, I had a chance to fly three type model series at a time. So A through D Hornet, EF Super Hornet, and the couple F-16 A's and B's they have up there. But we were expected to take tests on all of them every once in a while and annual simulators. How about for you? I mean, I don't know how many can you fly at once and what's required of you before you jump in one as far as level of expertise goes, because sure, it's just a test. You know, I I shouldn't even put it that way, but the point is you can still have an emergency and people can still get killed, right? So oh yeah, I always wondered how that works. Well, we don't actually have a limit to the number of planes you can check out. It's up to both yourself and the chief pilot how many that they want to let you check out. And generally, everybody that we have are some really experienced pilots. Almost all of them, like I said, not everybody is retired from the military, but most of them are probably retired from the military and have pretty vast repertoire of different airplanes that they've flown in their life. But like right now, I'm qualified in the T-34, F-18, F-15, DC-8. You know, eventually I'll be qualified in the X-59 when it flies. But there was a time when I also had the F-16, F-18, F-15, T-34, U-2, just like six or seven different airplanes. The biggest pain in the rear is, you know, we have yearly check rides that you alluded to. So mm-hmm. I swear, like every time you turn around, I'm like, oh, I got to take another check ride. <laughs> so you're taking tests, taking check ride, doing, you know, emergency procedures, either simulators if they're available or doing at least some form of a uh, tabletop with an instructor or that kind of thing. So you end up doing a lot. It was interesting the other day, I suddenly realized, you know, we don't get a lot of time every year. Like when you were qualified in the Hornet, you had a decent amount of flight time that you got in a year. You know, when I first got here, I probably got more than a hundred hours a year in the Hornet. Now I probably don't even get 50. Mm. The F-15 is even less than that. But uh, when I look back at the same time, I'm like, oh my God, I've been qualified in the F-18 for 17 years. (laughs) <laughs> between my time that I did an exchange with the Navy and my time at NASA. And the same thing with the F-15. I, I took a check ride Tuesday and I went, oh my God, that was the, I think the 18th or 19th check ride that I've taken in yeah. the F-15. Um, wow. It's very interesting because even though you don't have a lot of hours, there's a certain experience that just goes with the fact that you've been doing it for that long just because you soak up like you used to go to the squadron bar afterwards. Right. We always joke that, you know, that's where you learned everything. Oh, of course. When you went in there, had a drink afterwards, that's when you found out what really happened or what happened or, you know, when it came down to what went on, how they handled it. We ran into a similar thing years ago to where we have two different places out here at Armstrong. We have a place in Palmdale and we have a place up at Edwards. And so my pilot forces were split. We had a meeting on Monday, but we weren't in the same place. It was mostly done like we're doing everything today on Zoom or on the telephone. Mm -hmm. But eventually we decided every other week we need to meet somewhere where we're all together and we can see each other and somebody can go, what was it that happened to you the other day? And how did that happen? You know, and there's nothing that beats that and the information flow that goes back and forth there just because it's hard when you're not all in the same place. Oh, yeah. And I think as a society, without going on too big a tangent, we've certainly had a lot of backwards movement in that regard with everyone, you know, supposed to stay home. And Mm -hmm. if you do go out, you got to put on two face shields, it seems like, or whatever they want you to do. But yeah, I mean, we are a social species and that's how, gosh, until there was formal writing, right? That's how stories got told was just sitting around the campfire. But no, that sounds good. 
The interesting thing we've found from this pandemic that forces us onto these platforms like Teams and Zoom and all the other stuff, Mm -hmm. one of the things that we found, and I mentioned before that we have people spread throughout the country on all these different NASA centers. When I was doing an X-59 simulation, what we realized was, hey, I got it on my phone. Why don't I just put my phone on my chest, put my earphones in, you guys all dial into the meeting, and the engineers that work in Virginia can watch me do the sim and ask me questions and listen to me, you know, commenting on the flight controls of the airplane. And it was outstanding. We looked at each other and said, you know, we would have never thought to do something like this except for having this happen. And I mean, right before I got on with this, I was participating with the Lockheed test pilot on X-59 was doing a sim in the Lockheed sim while I was looking over his shoulder and talking to him and asking him questions. You know, and I didn't have to actually be there, which yeah. allows better use of your time sometimes when it comes to that. Sure. But it's really interesting, just some of the weirdness that comes from these. Test piloting from the comfort of home, huh? All right. Well, so on that note, though, is what you do at NASA Armstrong unclassified generally or mostly or completely? or Because there's a lot of stuff out there, obviously, that's, gosh, they won't even acknowledge the projects. And so if I'm treading on dangerous ice here, please tell me anyway. But if you've got a phone, you know, showing what you're doing, I'm guessing most of what you're doing is unclassified. Yeah, most of the greatest number of stuff that we do is unclassified at NASA, Mm -hmm. just because of the stuff we were talking about before for the public domain. Right. Yeah. So it's not very common to do anything, you know, when it comes to other realms. Okay. And just circling back, not to beat the dead horse, but so Mm -hmm. in the F-18, at least in the Navy, and I don't know if yours are any different, we had, I think, two pages of immediate action item things that you had to memorize, right? So if you're out of control, it's controls, release, feed off, rudder pedal, speed brake in, if stellar control, throttles idle, blah, blah, blah. And I can still rattle this off because I did it for so long. So when you're going from an F-18 that's got two pages of this to an F-15, is it the same for you guys? Just kind of getting back to, I guess I wonder, is there a level of expertise that assumes if you have a problem, you can deal with it? Or if that is part of the aircraft, in the case of the F-18, you're expected to know it all. Yeah, I mean, you still have your, whether you want to call it caps, you know, if you're F-16 guy or boldface Mm -hmm. or whatever. So, and depending on the airplane, we have that. We tend to take what, you know, like in the T-34, because that was made for the nuggets going through a Pensacola. I'm like, my God, there's like five pages for the world's simplest airplane. (laughs) So in that case, there are certain things that we're like, we're going to pare it down to these, whatever, when it comes to it. Because you abort the same way in most airplanes. That's right. Bring the throttles back, get on the brakes, got a hook, you throw it down. That's right. Not a whole lot else. You know, there are some other <laughs> intricacies depending on what you got. And I ran into that while teaching at Navy Test Pilot School. I actually had a guy come in. He goes, oh, my God, I'm required to know how to do stuff in a lot of different airplanes. And I said, yeah, that's <laughs> kind of the job. And he just kind of looked and I said, but I said, think about it. And I said, you're flying whatever it was, three different airplanes at the time. I said, how do you handle you know, a fire in this airplane. And he kind of spouts it out. How do you handle a fire in your F-18? He spouts it out. I said, how do you do it in a T-38? He spouts it. And I go, okay, so it's very similar in every one of those airplanes, isn't it? And he goes, well, yeah. I said, it's pretty much the same. I said, but there's some subtleties of the differences, right? T-38, there's no hook. The Hornet, you got to throw the hook down. So the big thing to remember is, Figure out what the differences are because you're going to handle it the same for the chunk that you're going to handle the same. Certain things, it's probably not that critical if you get certain things out of order. Other things, yeah, it makes sense. you got to do them in order. But otherwise, just be smart and know where your differences are. Yeah. We run into that. The 15 and the 18 are very interesting. The biggest thing is if you've been flying one a lot and then you jump to the other one. Uh, I'm always trying to find the flap switch, I swear, because you throw the gear up, that's not too hard, because the gear is always right there, left-hand side, forward. You know, you go to, oh, wait, where's the flap switch in this one? Oh, it's up here on that one, back here on this one. So, And the other weird thing is the F-15 and F-18, the bleed switch is backwards between the two. And so whenever we do our yearly evals when it comes to it, There are certain things that we hit when it comes to the airplanes because of their difference. Mm. The Hornet, I think it's when you turn left is left off. The Eagle, it's on versus, you know, so it's, you have to remember, okay, (laughs) do it, you know, remember which airplane you're in because, you know, it's going to be backwards if you don't watch it. Weren't these both McDonnell Douglas before Boeing? They were, you figures, yeah. Left hand, not talking to the right hand. Oh boy. Yeah. All right. So I want to ask you about some of these airplanes, but before I do on 
this podcast we've had, whether it was listener questions or episodes, some discussion on the, and I'll just stick with the Navy because that's the terminology I'm familiar with, like developmental tests and operational tests. So your friends over there at China Lake, I think there's VX31, and you can correct me mm-hmm. if I'm wrong here, that's doing the DT, and VX9 that's doing the OT. Yep. And so as I understand, the 31 guys will grab a new airplane or some new modification and kind of put it through its paces. And then the vampires will do some of the weapons and all that. So if you could help me with the air force equivalent, and then do you fit into that or are you completely separate? Like, in other words, I'm guessing the F 35 didn't necessarily come over to you or maybe it did, but maybe some of the things that you did ended up on the F 35. So suddenly this is a very big chocolate mess of a question, but hopefully you can find something in there. (laughs) No, it's actually a very good question. The Air Force has a similar thing where they have the DT guys are kind of like the VX-31 that you talked about. So those are most of the people that are right there at Edwards. They will frequently, depending on if it's a major program, have some operational testers embedded with the development testers. But then you'll also find that there's over at Nellis, I think it's the 422, and they are an operational test squadron. So they're going to take all the development that came from whatever the weapon system or change to the airplane goes over to them, and they're going to look at how to employ it when it comes to all the other kind of stuff where the DT guys are just, says it's supposed to do this. Did it do that? Yes. They're also going to try and comment because they have that background on how reliable and how well it performs, but ultimately it's going to be the operational testers. Now, when it comes to NASA, we're very research-based. You know, my title is actually research test pilot. So a lot of the stuff before it ever hits development is developed, say, at NASA Armstrong. For example, we have an airplane that sits out there, beautiful F-15, if you've ever seen it out there. uh, People will call it the active F-15, but it has a canard on the front of it. So it's not a normal F-15. The canard is actually the tail of a Hornet. That's right. The horizontal stabilizers. So it's got a canard on the front, normal F-15 wing, and then it's got the normal stab in back. It had what we call 3D nozzles. So it had full 3D nozzles. So that means that they can go up, down, left, right, and then obviously you can go faster, slower. So it was a full thrust vectored system. So early on when it came to research. We did a lot of research on that. And there's other airplanes like the X-31 that was out there. There was an F-16 that was a thrust vectored F-16. So there's a lot of thrust vector research that went on for years and years. And now if you go look at the F-22, it has thrust vectored nozzles when it comes to it as part of flight control system. So there are pieces of what we do early on when it comes to some of the research that will then eventually kind of leak into what happens in the development and then eventually operations. So we are related. It's just we're way early compared to all those other guys. But you can see your fingerprint show up down the generation in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Probably one of the best examples is uh, I worked as the NASA pilot on the uh, Auto GCAS, which is the Automatic Ground Collision Avoidance System. Okay. They had been working on that thing for years in research, and it got to us, and we were the final round of it. And it was a great project. We had uh, Lockheed Martin, NASA, and the Air Force all together. And I think Cal Span had a pilot because he was very experienced in doing this kind of work. So Kevin Prosser was on our team as well. So we had one test pilot from each of those organizations. This was a system that would allow you to go fly low levels and go do strafing missions, all the other kind of stuff. It's running in the background, and its job was to save you from whacking into the earth. And a lot of people, especially, they get, the, oh, you know, I need to go lower than that. No, you didn't, because we, uh, we were flying 200-foot low levels up the Kern River Canyon, not setting the system off. They did just such a, an amazing job with it. So our job was due to the research piece of this. And then when it finished, they were supposed to put the tweaks on it. it go down the street. And then the F-16 guys were going to finish the development of it. And then eventually it was going to go to the operational testers. So I did that probably 11 years ago, I think it was, but it slowly made its way through. But, you know, it's probably been one of the tests at NASA that has probably meant the most to me. It was some of the most dangerous stuff I did because a lot of it was high risk. My wife did not like those tests. But in the (laughs) end, that has now saved, I think it is 10 F-16s and 11 lives. 
that's been out there. That's a huge thing. And I mean, it's great. We get the email every now and then, and it sends chills up your spine to know that that person is coming home to their family Mm -hmm. because that work you did a decade ago, it just, one of those things, like I said, that's something to be really proud of. It's gone on. It's now being incorporated into the Joint Strike Fighter and other aircraft in the future when it comes to not whacking into the ground. Uh, we had Colonel Tucker Hamilton on the show uh, yeah. for the F-35. Yeah, he had a hand in that somewhere, as I recall. He also mentioned the same thing. And there's, in fact, videos on YouTube of aircraft pointing towards the ground. And, you know, of course, the flight lead yelling, you know, wake up, yep. recover. It's chill raising. Thankfully, you know, we get to see the video because it's not destroyed. So may I challenge you, though, quickly on why the numbers are different, 10 and 11? Uh, a two-seater. Oh, okay. So it was a two seat F-16. So, and it's been interesting because one of the areas that we always knew could be one of the areas where it did a lot more saves is especially the F-16 because it's a 9G airplane is the G-lock. Mm-hmm. So third to half of them probably have been because of a G-lock. And so the airplane's just flying at the ground, but yep. it recovers itself. So. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Nils, let's transition then a little bit to some of the aircraft that have come through where you're working there. And and you started with some of them, the X-1. I think most listeners, I hope, are familiar with Chuck Yeager and the right stuff, of course, you know. And then the X-15, pretty popular as well. And I know there's a whole bunch of others, but one that kind of was the first to stick into my mind as a young man was the X-29. I don't know where that came from as far as like, did they take an aircraft, but it's the one with the Ford swept wings. So I'm guessing, was that a little before your time? Cause it's been probably since the eighties, I think. X-29 was a little bit before my time, but one of my bosses used to fly it. Actually, a couple of my bosses, I think, used to fly it uh, who've since retired. But there was a time when a lot of the X-planes that we worked on, and frequently it was done out of NASA, were things like the X-29 and the X-31. And and I talked about the active airplane that was there. It was an F-16 that had a, a lot of modifications to it. There was a lot of stuff that they were doing when it came to advanced flight controls and maneuverability. The X-29 was especially one of those when it came to a lot of the maneuverability and that kind of thing. So back in those days, there was a lot of stuff going on where it was early research, but, you know, and then the early research guys would go out and do essentially BFM with these new highly maneuverable airplanes to go see how much of an advantage is this technology, that kind of stuff. Everybody seems to have moved on past that stuff now, and there's different, everything seems to be more systems-based now when it comes to, if I look down the street at what my friends in the Air Force and the Navy and that kind of stuff are doing. So it always seems to be that there's a different morphing of what everybody's kind of looking at and playing Mm -hmm. with. But back in those days, it was a lot of maneuverability kind of stuff. So the X-29 and the X-31, are those aircraft going to be built from scratch or are you going to take what you've got and kind of tweak it, right? So like there was an F-16, I want to say it was XL that had like a giant delta wing kind of thing. Right. I presume that was just an F-16 and they changed the wing. But where do you start with some of these other one-offs, if you will? Well, like F-16 XL, there was a two-seater and a single-seater. So they had a lot of the same systems of the F-16, but the outer mold line, like you said, was a little bit different. The X-31 and the X-29, their outside was definitely different when it came to how they did it. But they were a Franken airplane, which is very much like the X-59 that we're building now. So, you know, you got this is the gear from this and the engine out of that and the stick from this and the throttles out of that and the hydraulics, you know, so... (laughs) It's very much a Franken airplane. So even though the airplane looks brand new, it's really not. Some of the parts might be new, but it's old design of an AMAD out of something like an F-18 or something like that. So, and trying to get them all to play together, that's always fun. So my hat's off to those engineers who have to design these X planes because they're one of, you know, and you call up your subcontractor and you say, hey, I need you to build me one of these. And they're like, how many hundred do you want? I want five, 500. No, no five. And they're like, I don't, well, I don't want to spend all my time building you five of these things versus 500. So, right. you know, it's a tough job they have to be able to do something like that. And these Franken aircraft, I mean, you may not want to admit it, but I guess how reliable are they, right? Because in a fleet squadron, all we did were F-18s. We had the supply, we had the people, we had the parts, we had everything. And yet things would still break. So are these aircraft fairly reliable? And you've got, I'm sure, some pretty smart folks working on them, but how frequent is it to get in and something is just not communicating with something else or gear doesn't come down or some nuisance gripe of some sort? 
You definitely have those times. The big thing is you don't have nearly the reps that you have, you know, out there in a fleet squadron or stuff that mm. go on there. And because they are test airplane, they do get babied to a good degree. So okay. surprisingly, they are very reliable. The toughest thing is probably the logistics chain. Mm-hmm. You know, when something breaks and then you're looking for a block what airplane and where are we going to find that? You know, one of the things that when I first got here at Armstrong, we were flying pre-production F-18s. So, I mean, you'd love to come up and see. So, I mean, it was always fun to bring the test pilot. Navy test pilot school would come through and, and I'd say, this is not a, an F-18B technically. That's a TF-18 Oh wow! because it's technically not a B. Go look at the data plate on it. The fun part would be to take all the Hornet guys around and go, okay, here's the differences. This is how you know this is pre-production. So look, the aileron doesn't go all the way out. There's this that's in there. And we flew some of them and we had one of the two seaters. It was always funny because it had all the same parts as a normal B, but they weren't in the same place. So when something broke, it was really fun for the maintainers to go, I know it needs to be replaced. I just got to go figure out where it is on this airplane. So yeah. it was always a challenge. Over the years, it just made sense as we got the free puppies from the Navy as they were, you can park them in the desert down there in Arizona, or we can park them in the desert up there in California, and we can fly out a couple thousand more hours on them before we park them for good. Oh, yeah. So your F-18 experience, was that in the high alpha research vehicle, HARV, or was it in something else? I started as an instructor at Navy Test Pilot School on exchange. So I left the F-15 squadron and then taught at the Navy school in the Mighty T-2 and the Beaver, the Otter, the X-26, and the uh, Hornet. The funny thing is, I think the same Hornets that I taught in now sit on the ramp at Armstrong because they're slowly getting rid of the, some of those. So I'm like, hey, I have time in that bureau number. The Hornet's a great airplane. I mean, as you know, it's oh yeah, great sports car. I love that thing. Sure. Can we talk a little bit about Harv, though? Or was that before your time? Did you get a chance to be part of that one? Well, Harv was actually before my time. It's another one of the ones that when we were talking about all that maneuverability stuff that they were doing before, okay. it used a different system. When I first got I don't know, it may even still be out on our ramp somewhere. It was another thrust vectored airplane. And what it had, it was paddles that sat back there that would get into the flow versus actually a vectored nozzle. It also had some other really cool stuff that it did for high alpha and high alpha maneuverability. And some of the stuff that it did were some really cool ideas that they went and played with years ago. So I knew people that flew it. You know, I never got a chance to fly it, but I got to see some of their research, you know, when they presented it at the Society of Experimental Test Pilots and that stuff. But it was a very cool airplane. And we have a, a number of engineers that work with me now that are HARV engineers and flight control guys from way back. All right, Nell, so what do you spend most of your time doing now then? Well, a lot of my time is done uh, with supersonics and the uh, X-59 and projects that are leading up to flying the X-59. But the other things I do is uh, I actually look at trying to get more projects to flight, things that are in the labs and NASA, and get them on an airplane and advance the technology. The other big thing that I've been doing uh, over the years is helping to write requirements or helping to be in what we call pre-formulation for other large demonstrations or uh, other X-planes. Like after X-59 and the sonic thump, we actually have uh, electrified propulsion flight demonstration coming up. And after that, we hope to actually have a uh, subsonic flight demonstrator as well to advance some of those technologies. So to make flying cheaper for everyone, make it less pollution when it comes to all that kind of stuff, Hmm. much along all those same kind of lines that you'll see. People always wonder going, hey, how come I haven't heard about that? We're like, no, 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 we're working on that too. It's just down the line a couple of years away. How and who decides what to put money and time into? I mean, if you're out flying, I would think you would be a great candidate for, hey, we should look into this. But on the other hand, there could be industry requirements or, again, engineering ideas. Hey, we could try this in the wind tunnel, but now we need to go test it. Is there like some giant whiteboard where you guys kind of brainstorm, boy, we'd really love to go fly something like this? There kind of sort of is in that industry does feed to NASA. They're constantly talking to the guys up at headquarters of here's the stuff that we would like to see you guys invest your time, money, you know, and efforts into. So there's some of that that goes on. There's also 
introduction technologies that we've been working on for years that as they've matured, we now know, hey, these are ready to go. These need to be advanced. They need to go on a demonstrator now. So there's a little bit of that. It was interesting because, you know, as a pilot, I looked and I had the same question. I'm like, how do we get some of this stuff done? And I found out who one of the guys was that seems to have this influence. And I went and had lunch with him and said, hey, uh, do you have a test pilot on your board that does this stuff? He goes, no, that's a good idea. You want to be it? I said, yes, I do. So I said, you know, somebody having, the weird thing about a test pilot is we're the ultimate generalist when it comes to a lot of stuff. I mean, I worked on flight control stuff. I work on supersonics. I worked on stuff, you know, for the space program when it comes to testing radar elements for perseverance and curiosity. There's a huge breadth of stuff that we work on, yeah. you know, as test pilots. So a lot of times, as you kind of alluded to, we actually do have a good vision of here's some stuff that might be ready to go. Awesome. All right. Well, I want to be respectful of your time, Nils. I just have a couple listener questions I want to shoot at you. We can call it a lightning round if you're willing. Sure. Okay. First one is from Scott Manny. Now, you probably already covered this. Will the X-59 be based at NASA Armstrong, and when is it scheduled to begin its test? I think the latest thing we're saying is it ships in 21 and flies in 22. Okay. So it should be flying in 22. It will fly its first flights out of Palmdale. And about 10 flights later, five to 10 flights later, it'll move up to Edwards where we are. And then, I don't know, roughly 18 months later to two years, it'll be travel and roadshow around the country. Okay. Joe Kunzler says, how long until we have a working space plane like the X-30? That's a good question, because I think if you see something like that, you're going to see it coming from industry. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't doubt that you'll see something out of somebody like uh, an Elon Musk or a Jeff Bezos or somebody like that. But it really depends uh, ultimately on what makes the most sense for them for how to bring whatever it is back. But I think you'll see something out of commercial enterprise or maybe Virgin Galactic or somebody like that, because theirs is, you know, kind of sort of like one. Well, and speaking of that, this next question might be beyond the scope of today's discussion, but Jim Gundog asks, why continue with the Dream Chaser project when SpaceX Crew Dragon seems to be a cheaper, more affordable option? So I'm guessing, is that slightly out of your wheelhouse? Yeah, I mean, that, I got no idea on that one. So I'll let the, you know one of the guys down there at JSC take that one. <laughs> All right, so Derek Daly, who actually works for NASA, he says, why does NASA have some of the oldest F-15s and F-18s? So, for example, F-15B, number 837, the one with the canards, is described as the first two-seat F-15 built by McDonnell Douglas. Is it, and this is a total guess on his part, he says, that those early builds accomplished their original DOD missions with relatively few flight hours and thus can fly longer at NASA. And you kind of already mentioned that, didn't you? Yeah, essentially, we don't put a lot of hours on our airplanes. And we're very fortunate that a lot of times when DOD is done with some of their airplanes, and we get them all the time, sometimes it's just for parts. Other times, you know, we will look and they have life left on them and they will give them to us. And we do support them when it comes to chase and things like that. And Hmm. a lot of the research that we do is early seedling research for them. So it was well put. Speaking of that, Niels, let me ask, like, so when I was in the fleet, a good year was about 250 hours. What do you typically fly either in a month or in a year? Well, because I'm a lot of management, I don't get nearly as many. When I was a line guy, I was probably getting about two, like my first year at NASA, I was busy. I probably got 250, 300 hours a year. Oh, nice. And it really depends. Like our guys that fly the big airplanes, They'll get 300, almost one of the guys gets almost 500 hours a year, but he's getting at 10 hours at a pop, you know, so that's a little different. (laughs) I'm supposed to get at least a hundred hours a year. Okay. So, which I think was similar, I think required in the Navy, they wanted you to have a hundred hours as a minimum. And most of the time it's probably about 150 on good years. All right. Our last question is from Richard Hartnack. He's another supporter, and uh, Nack was a Vietnam-era F-4 pilot. He says, with the amount of information available to F-35 pilots and the additional prospect down the road of pilots controlling drones in flight as well, have you researched cockpit saturation? How much can a pilot handle in terms of acting on incoming information, controlling other aircraft, responding to requests, et cetera? What are the practical limits? And I didn't really ask you this today, Nils, but are you guys guys, you seem to me very much research aircraft, wind tunnel type stuff. Are you as much involved with what's between our ears? Well, 
NASA overall is, one of the sure. big areas that everybody's looking at now is artificial intelligence and what tasks. I had a meeting this morning, actually, on the very subject, or at least close to the same subject that he's talking about. Is What things can you offload to AI, or as I'll call them, R2-D2, to take care of <laughs> versus, you know, what do you really need to get to the pilot? So mm -hmm. that is actually a hot area of research, both for us and DOD. It can be very similar depending on what it is that you're going to go do, whether it, even in a commercial world to a degree. Since I'm a supersonics guy, if you think about it, uh, how's that air traffic control system? They're not used to having multiple airplanes moving twice as fast through the system. And if you need to make a change, how do you get ATC to let you reroute yourself in time to actually make something happen? So you get that OTA loop or whatever is compressing even on the commercial side, not just on the military side when it comes to all the loop of decision making. It's all getting shorter all the time. So what are the technologies out there to help us out? No doubt. All right, Nels, this has been a lot of fun. So I want to ask you our final couple questions. And one is, what does the future hold? But looks like you found a good little niche for yourself, huh? Oh, yeah, it's great. I love what I'm doing. This is what I wanted to do when I was 16 years old. And a teacher handed me the book, The Right Stuff, that you mentioned earlier. And I decided I want to go do that. Just like you when you were in the Navy and that, it's not a J-O-B if you love coming to work every day. That's right. So there's a lot of great things about what I get to do and love what I do. I hope I get to do it for a long time. <laughs> and the other thing I like is They've given me a seat at the table occasionally, and now I just got to get them to listen to me when it comes to some of the future stuff. <laughs> hey, one step at a time, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay. Final question then. How did someone come up with thrills for Nils Larson? It's kind of funny in that, you know, you figure, oh, he's a test pilot, you know, so thrills or something like that. And in actuality, it's exactly the opposite. Back when I was an instructor, I was actually Deniff one day. I had a pretty bad head cold. And my best friend, who was also an instructor with me, his friends were visiting. So we went out to the golf course that day. So we went out to the golf course and I was just severely under the weather. So everybody's just having a great time, you know, doing what you do on the golf course. And I'm just sitting there like a bump on a log the whole time. So <laughs> they looked over at me and go, well, look at Thrillsy over there, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, sure. So it became Thrills so because I was exactly opposite of Thrills. There you go. Well, call signs are like that. So, yep. well, Thrills, Nils, this has been a lot of fun. And uh, I want to thank you for your time and all the important work you're doing up there. And we can certainly leave links to your websites and talk with your PAOs about uh, the other stuff you guys are doing and w we can help promote. But otherwise, what did I not ask you that maybe you think the folks out there that are uh, interested in military aviation and what you guys are doing, what should we know about NASA Armstrong maybe that I didn't ask? I think probably the biggest thing is we're always busy. We love what we're doing. There's more going on than you know about. And eventually it gets out there and you get to see what's going on. Like you pointed out before, that S in NASA is really big and we kind of get overshadowed sometime, but it doesn't mean that the work we're doing isn't as important and it's out there changing people's lives as well. And everybody that's out there loves working for NASA. I haven't found a single person that has hated working there. There's a lot of great things about working for the meatball. Always wanted to do it. And uh, hey, I got to do it for what, 14 years now. So cool. but a lot of great stuff going on and uh, hope to keep doing it for a lot more. We're glad to have folks like you up there doing it because it sounds like you guys are very talented and educated and wise and all those other great accolades. So thanks for that. And thanks for your time today, Nils. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And it's uh, been great talking to you. All right, big thanks again to Nils and the whole NASA Armstrong team. Before we talk about it, though, I do want to make one quick correction. Recky and Knack, who had a question, was a Vietnam-era F-4 Rio, not pilot. And for all his buddies who might be uh, thinking he's trying to muscle in, that was my mistake, not his. But anyway, big picture-wise, I thought that was really interesting. I learned a lot. Recky, what did you think of that interview? I loved it. It provided like a lot of insight on like not only what they do at NASA Armstrong, but kind of like this career progression of test pilots. It's sort of like where the military test pilots go, like how do they continue after they retire? Do they go to industry? But NASA like has this expertise. I also was a little bit embarrassed because I think I've always called it 
the NACA valve or the NACA scoop or the NACA inlet. And now I know that I look like an idiot doing it. And to all the people that I've taught that I've like pointed out like, oh, this is the NACA inlet. It was designed by NACA. I now know I should have been saying NACA. Well, but NACA is so much easier than NACA. I think you could be forgiven for that, but I guess it does show that for people in that community, that's just one of those little inside scoops, huh? Yeah, we're all Navy, right? So it's like you're supposed to be the acronym as a word. Like we're trained that way. So right. I, I thank you for giving me leeway on that. But <laughs> I kind of stuck on that like, whoops. Yeah, no problem. So we kind of danced around it a little bit, but NASA Ames, Armstrong, JPL. I mean, you can Google it and see that NASA has locations all over the country. But how does all that fit together? And where do you and your current role at NOAA fit in all this, Rocky? So NASA, Ames, Armstrong, Dryden, they all kind of support different resources that NASA has. We've worked with a lot of different NASA aircraft on like some of our airborne science. If you think about like the military, different squadrons will have different aircraft. Down in Houston, they have the T-38, the G-3, and I think G-4 or G-5. And so they'll use those aircraft for airborne science and also training astronauts out of wallops. They have a couple of different aircraft that use for airborne science. Langley is a little bit more research. So NASA has different aircraft that will support different science initiatives. We have the same thing at NOAA. So where we have different line offices that will focus on space weather or the fisheries, mammal mitigation, or hurricanes, we use our aircraft and instrumentation for different missions to support all of our different vendors. So someday you're doing research for new instrumentation for one office. And then a lot of times we actually work with NASA on different types of instruments. The WB-57, mm-hmm. I think that's the Canberra. It's like the high altitude plane that looks like a U-2. They fly out of JSC down in Houston, and they've actually flown over hurricanes, and we share data information. So a lot of that science and airborne research and then some of the space satellite calibration, we actually work together depending on which aircraft and which center and what the project is that's being funded. That makes sense. And you said before the interview that you're on watch or call. That doesn't mean you're not flying. It just means you're available for a storm. But I assume you, when there aren't storms, are you still keeping busy flying other missions? We have a lot of other missions. I was flying an ocean winds mission out of Alaska in February on the P3. And we were flying new instruments that are going to not only fly on satellites eventually, we were comparing the data that we were getting on those instruments to what's coming down from a lot of the weather satellites to make sure that the data that we were getting, we were correcting properly. And that sounds like a NASA mission, mm-hmm. right? That's like, shouldn't NASA be working on the, on the satellites? But NOAA and NASA support like our nation's science initiatives. So we kind of both sort of take this other science when we're not in hurricane season and make sure that we're calibrating our satellites, we're inventing new instruments, and we're making sure we understand like our world atmospheric model for winds. Yeah. So we stay pretty busy. Right now I'm on the watch bill. Like we have like a hurricane watch bill. So we're waiting for storms, but during that time, I've got some new flight tests coming up with some modifications that we're making to the aircraft, and we're doing like a little bit of training while we just kind of wait around for the tropics to heat up. Okay. Yeah, because the season starts in what, June, goes through November, but most of the activity is around September? Yeah, that's correct. Cool. Well, getting back to thrills, I really found this interview enlightening because when I thought about the F-18s and F-15s out there that those guys are flying, and then of course you see the cats and dogs with the Ford swept wings and the Delta wing F-16, I guess I never really appreciated what they were doing. I guess I just kind of lumped them in with, oh, it's more testing. But the whole point about research and being at the very beginning where then it ends up in the DT and the OT, as we talked about, was kind of the point to me that really made sense where NASA has been all along. Yeah, it was really cool after knowing some of the guys at Strike at VX23 who worked on some of the stuff for GCAS, hearing how they started it out at NASA. Mm -hmm. NASA will start out with those early technical readiness levels. And so like things aren't really into full production. And I think Nils explained it way better than I could have. It is cool to see like it starts out as an idea, like some brilliant doctoral candidate (laughs) gets three or four hours of flight time on an F-15 at NASA. And then that develops into something that the military can use or the general population can use to make aircraft more effective or lethal or more safe. Like it's awesome to see how early that starts and that NASA is the organization doing it. Yeah, It's cool. Oh, no doubt. And just since we recorded that, which was, I guess, uh, you and I are recording here in early June. I think I recorded with him a little over a month ago, but I saw an announcement that United was in contract to buy something downstream of the X-59 to get back into the civilian 
world of supersonic travel, which we lost with the Concorde years back. So that was kind of neat. He did mention something about, you know, no supersonic flight over continental United States. And I know you and I are aware he means in general, because Mm -hmm. obviously ranges like Nellis, even up at Fallon and, and maybe down where you are, though, you're probably not doing it in your airplanes, but there are some areas where we can fly supersonic. And I suppose it's away from cultural centers, but what's the big deal in general with flying supersonic over the United States? Well, other than getting in trouble, <laughs> they like to keep us high for like anywhere where we would do the supersonic runs when we were in flight test. We actually had a corridor, mm-hmm. I think about 31,000 feet and it's over water and it keeps you from having that boom, like destroy people's property or break glass or just doing it safely offshore. You probably saw that in the fleet where it's, if you yeah. had an, an accidental like supersonic run, you had to report it so that the department of defense could like address it with the people who were possibly affected by all that noise. Yeah. But it is interesting now to see that not only is industry funding it, science is funding it, everyone's kind of pushing NASA to be the lead of solving this problem. And then once they figure it out, industry will take it into production. It's a pretty exciting time in aviation. Oh yeah, I agree. Have you ever accidentally broken the number? Somewhere you weren't supposed to, Jeff? All the time. (laughs) All the time. (laughs) And especially in Fallon, because there are some ranchers and small communities under the, what is it, Fallon Range Training Complex. If you did break the number where you weren't supposed to or below, I want to say it was down, you could go as low as like 11,000 feet. Then you had to come back and write something up. But of course, with the tax ranges being so good these days, a lot of times they already knew. So they were just waiting to see if you would come clean or not. Hey, I wanted to ask you, he and I were talking about some of the bold face slash, you know, immediate action items. When you fly a lot of different type model series, as we might call it in the Navy, did you find that to be the case? Was there ever a time where you flew a bunch of different aircraft and you found it difficult? Or did I overstate the concern with complicating uh, different types of aircraft when you fly a bunch at once? It was difficult at the beginning of test pilot school. And I really liked the way that he described it to the student. I remember having that similar conversation where it's like, if you want to fly a lot of stuff, you have to study a lot of stuff. And I've had some of my JOs at NOAA asking the same thing. It's like, do you just memorize anything? And you can start to figure out, like, I need to know my bold face. I need to know my normal procedures. You start to figure out like what you need to know about each plane. Like what are the couple things that are, are going to kill me? And then after that, it gets a lot easier and aircraft is an aircraft. One of the Italian test pilots told me you have to be able to, the one thing you have to know is how to be able to adjust the seat and turn on the battery. Because if you don't know that, then the person in the back or the people in the control room are going to think you're an idiot. Everything else you can probably get away with. (laughs) And then once you get used to it, it becomes really routine. So in April, I flew four different aircraft in one week that I had experience in all of them. But I think the hardest time was getting my call sign right. That's every time I fly. Maybe that's the hardest thing. So maybe that's not a good answer. You mean your flight call sign, not your personal call sign. No, my flight call <laughs> sign. I think everyone in the Fire Pilot Cup podcast knows me as Rocky. So yeah, I can remember that one. Uh, yeah, not to belabor the point, but if you ever get so saturated that you can't remember who you are, then yeah, clearly you've got some challenges there. But cool. Now, he said that he was a Navy guest instructor for a while or exchange tour. Was that during your time or? No, I don't think so. I've heard about him. So that's why I was really excited when you asked me because I was like, oh, I know that name. Um, So I've heard of him, but we didn't overlap at TPS. Okay. All right, Recky. Well, what else on NASA flight tests? Again, I really enjoyed Nils's uh, interview and, and you added a lot of extra detail. Thanks very much. But what else should I or the listener know about all this? So for a lot of your listeners who are interested in aviation, we came to it with like initially when we talked about test pilot school and with NOAA and with NASA this is like a cool application of the mission. Like this isn't necessarily putting like warheads on foreheads, but this is like our nation's science and engineering and seeing it at that early start and the practicality and how it evolves is so awesome. So for all of your listeners who are excited about engineering science and aircraft, like I just hope that this just like opens their minds and opens like their interest to how this stuff all gets applied into aviation other than it just in production. Well, and you said it earlier, it's an exciting time in aviation. I get a lot of questions here on the show about, oh, you know, I want to be a pilot, but I'm still in college. So will there still be manned fighters by the time I get there? And I say, yeah, of course. I mean, they're just buying this F-35. So I think it's a good time. And I hope we've inspired people to look at the test side of it. I mean, you went to test pilot school, I went to Top Gun, but I think there's different avenues for people who have different levels of interest. And so, yeah, that's good. Hopefully we uh, help people out. Hey, before you go, though, uh, I think last time we talked to you, you were throwing your hat in the ring for this organization we talked about today. Anything new there? Not at the moment. 
at this time, I'm loving my job at NOAA. I love flying into hurricanes. I love the science that we fly and that by studying the atmosphere of research, I hope I'm laying a strong foundation to someday transfer over to NASA, which I'm saying the word as an acronym. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm just like building more education in like our planetary systems. All right. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed for you and uh, I know they're looking for good people and you certainly qualify in my book. So appreciate that. All right. We can begin to transition to the wrap up. We've got some new Patreon supporters we always like to identify. So we've got strike leads, Christopher Busey, Chris Whiting, and Kyle Karbowski. And we have two new mission commanders, Patrick Forney and Max Zanotti. In fact, you know what, Recky, I might have to ask for another favor from you because every month I bring back a past guest for a live 30-minute discussion where our uh, Patreon supporters can show up and chat and ask questions and stuff. So when we get done here, I'll see how your schedule looks. Maybe I can rope you into one of those. Yeah, I love to talk about science and airplanes almost as much as I love to talk about myself. So that sounds great. (laughs) All right, well, you can do both. Cool. Well, as a reminder, the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Recky, thanks for returning to the show. Always a pleasure to share the airwaves with you. Thanks for having me, Jello. All right. And for everyone else, Boat returns next week for another Warbirds episode. Now, if you follow us on social media, you'll know we change our cover image monthly. So take a look at June and you'll have a clue of which aircraft he's going to cover. That'll do it for this week. Thanks for visiting the Fighter Pilot Podcast. We'll see you next time. So long. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BBR Productions. Got a question for the show? Email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. For exclusive content and to help support the show, check out our Patreon page. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.